I preach on what I caption, overcoming the fiery trials. Overcoming the fiery trials. My anchor scripture is 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 13. I will read it across multiple varying translations. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse number 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful. Who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able? But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Now, pull it up in New Living Translation. New Living Translation. The temptation in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure it. What is that way out? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So anytime a man is tempted, God in delivering us from these temptations points us to his son. So it is relationship with his son that gives us access to the escape route from all the trials of the enemy. The first thing I discovered about this is that the Bible says that these temptations are common. They are not peculiar with you. They are common. So at some point in your journey with the Holy Spirit, you will suffer fiery trials. But if God is behind these trials, then it will be for your promotion. Romans 8 and verse 28, For I know that all things work together for good to them that are his and unto them that are the called according to his purpose. Somebody say amen. amen. That amen is not lie. Amen. Let me use an, an, an eagle as an example. Isaiah chapter 40, verse number 31. Isaiah 40, 31. Isaiah 40, 31. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Deuteronomy 32, verse number 11. As we lay the foundation for this teaching. Deuteronomy 32 and verse number 11. Like an eagle that rouses her cheeks. That is the eaglet. And hovers over her young. So he spread his wings to take them up. Oh, King James. I want to see that word fluttereth. Oh, King James. Thank you. As an eagle stirred up her nest, the word is to stir. You can't stir a thing without violence. When you want to stir a soup, what do you do? You upset the status quo. The soup looks calm, but you take a spoon. The same calm soup, you put it inside and you turn it. That stirring upsets the status.
two spoon that the soup is familiar with. But there is a reason every woman will stir her pot of soup so that they can blend, so they can be sweet. So as an ego stirred up her nest, fluttered over her young. How does an ego flutter over her young? You know, those mighty ego, they spread out their two wings close to the young that is just three weeks, one month old, and they flap it. As they keep flapping it, the wings of the little eaglet start falling off. That's the elementary part of the flying test of the eagle. When an eagle wants to train an eaglet to fly, he flutters the wing. And then all the soft wings of the eaglet falls off. New one begins to grow. Now, listen. There are three things the scripture shows us here. The first one is that the eaglet begins her journey in the comfortable nest. When an eaglet is given birth to, it is kept in a nest. In that nest, the eagle goes out, brings food, feeds the eagle, eaglet. The nest is comfortable. It becomes the home of the eaglet. The eaglet stays under the warmth of the ego. Just like when you read Psalm 23. You know, Psalm 23 is a journey to discipleship. Psalm 23 explains everything that happens from justification to sanctification. To deployment. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. You just give your life to Jesus. Everything you need, he provides. He makes me to lie down. You even ate until you lay down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still water. No skin pain. The water is so cool. He restores my soul. <laughs> He's saying, keep coming. Oh, pull it up so that they don't think I'm quoting my own scripture. So I'm doing three. You can start from verse three now. He says, keep coming. Keep coming. Psalm 23, verse 3. Okay, verse 2. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Verse number 3. He restored my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. This is where the discipleship begins. The first part is the first stage of our coming to the Lord. That's where justification comes in. Yay! That same person who was led beside the still water now begins to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. God does not train men in that part of the green pastures. He trains men in the shadows of death. That is when we will know that the Lord is with us. That is when we will put our faith to work. Violent faith is activated. I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod. God will have to discipline you. He will have to discipline your life. Thy rod and thy staff. When he's done disciplining you, he will use the staff and call you back. They comfort me. He now allows you to have several enemies because he knows without these enemies you cannot be eminent. How does a father take your food and prepare that food in the presence of your oppressors? Three things he's teaching you. One of them the church has not discovered. 
He's teaching you to war. But this time you don't fight for victory, you fight from victory. Because victory has been given already. Number two, he's also teaching you he can bless you despite the odds that are against you. It doesn't have to be the enemies around you. It doesn't matter how many have gone to native houses to oppress you. He's showing you, you he can bless you despite all odds your life has known. Thou preparest my table in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. It is only at this point that a man's cup can run over because the man has gone through the test. My cup runs over. Go on. Surely, goodness and mercy. Because during this season, you may have made mistakes. You may have done things you are not supposed to do. So the goodness of God follows you. But God knows that you might not be qualified for this goodness. So he asks mercy to accompany the goodness. The goodness of God and the mercies of God shall follow me all the days of my life. Why is God's goodness following a man so God can strengthen the man's relationship with, with himself? So God can strengthen our relationship with him. So why is God giving you a car? Why is God giving you billions of dollars, millions of dollars? Why will God want to give you hundreds of millions worth of contract? It is not so you backslide. It is so you will dwell. So the goodness of God should not take you away from God's presence. The goodness of God should rather cause you to dwell more in God's presence. There are a lot of people, please sit down, that as soon as God blesses them, God loses them. Before now, they have been praying for a visitation. All of a sudden, the visitation has come and then God loses them. God has lost them. They stop praying. People that made their money genuinely by seeking the face of God. Now they had billions and people are already telling them, you need to protect this money. So you need to join court. So why will God give us his goodness? He's giving us his goodness to strengthen our relationship with him. He's giving us this goodness so we can be closer to him. Pharaoh, let my people go so they can serve me. So God is letting you go for a lifetime of worship and service to him. Before God blessed you, before now, you used to stay in church almost every week. Now God has blessed you, you have changed your location to clubhouses. Your goodness and your mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. That I might dwell. So the blessings of God should gear us towards the blesser. Not take us away from the blesser. The blessed should be geared towards the blesser. Rather than being taken away from the blesser. The Bible says of Uziah. That as long as he sought the Lord in the days of Zechariah, who had this prophetic insight into visions and revelation, the Bible said the Lord prospered him until he was so blessed and so great and his heart was lifted up. That's what happens to a lot of us. It has even happened in homes. We see it in several homes. Your husband seemed humble, seemed holy, as much as there is no money. But immediately money comes, everything changes. That will not be your story. That will not be your story. The prayer you were praying for marriage, for God to send the man, God has sent the man. A lady told me, is there nothing I can do concerning the marriage course? Because I can't really come to sit down for one more time. You know, Maybe there is something they can give me because I'm rallying around for the wedding, organizing their shabbies. And I laughed. I said to her, why do you people prioritize foolishness? You have been praying for years for marriage to happen. Now it has happened. 
what you are doing is a night party club at the eve the night of your wedding you call it bridal shower no element of the spirit of God no sign that God is present you go to bring girls that open up their clothes to their God knows where keep them in the hotel bring guys keep guys in the hotel that night you will go over to the hotel room of your husband to be and then the girls one after the other will go to the guys so the blessings of God has started promoting Babylonian system in your life is that not what we see your goodness and your mercy shall follow me all the days of my life so that I can dwell. One of the things I discovered, any blessing that God gives that takes you away from God, God withdraws the blessing. That's why a lot of people say, I don't know how my business, my life began to crash. You were on a very fast lane into Babylon. In fact, sometimes God will have to save us from certain crash by taking away certain things from us. Yes. Yes. Sodom was a thriving city. It was the industrial and the economic hub of their time. But God had to deliver Lot from that place. Because there are corruptions are many. And I want to say this. Result does not mean God's approval. You can strike the rock in obedience. You can strike the rock in disobedience and water can still come out. So be careful when you succeed. Don't succeed the ways of Babylon. There is a kingdom system that brings us prosperity. So the first thing we see is that the eaglet is at the comfortable nest of the eagle. The comfortable nest of the eagle. The mother eagle feeds, protects, and sees to the needs of the eaglet. This is the way Christ treats us. Also as babes, but we are not meant to remain babes forever. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse number 2. 1 Peter 2, 2. Quickly. He said, as newborn babes desire sincere me milk of the world that ye may grow. Go on. If so be ye have tested that the Lord is gracious for whom coming is unto us a living stone disallowed indeed of all men but chosen of God and precious ye also are lively stones are built up so it begins with your journey as a newborn babe but you must be built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood at this time it begins to cost you things to follow God. So the second thing we see is that comfort is removed from the eaglet. So however there comes a time in the growing up experience of the eaglet that the mother ego stirred up her nest and fluttered her young, that is to ensure that the fragile wings, because not all the wings will fall off. There are some fragile wings that we need to fall off for the tougher one to grow. And if these tougher ones don't grow, the eaglet can never fly. 
so the mother eagle rips the soft feathers flapping her massive wings she blows away all the comfortable living materials all the comfortable that's what happens what has made living comfortable so this exposes the ego to there is something that is called briars these are these are some tiny kind of flowers it exposes the ego to briars to thorns at this point the ego knows you can't be in the nest forever because you know the nest is also most of the times it can be a tree sometimes it can be a rock so it exposes this ego eaglet anytime it comes and touches briars and stones some sharp edges it begins to come against it the eaglet begins to see the reason to grow wings in order to fly away so as these wings begin to grow the eaglet begins to desire flight. But if the eagle continues keeping the eaglet at the comfort of the nest, the eaglet will never fly. The third thing that happens is that the eagle gives the eaglet a flying test. The same place we are reading. The Bible says, no, that place, bring it back, sir. Deuteronomy. You were there. You just took it off. Deuteronomy 32, 11. Thank you, sir. So the Bible says, the eagle bearet them on her wings. What an eagle does is that an eagle takes up the eaglet, bears it on its wing and fly around. After a while, two to three days, it will carry the same eaglet and drop it at a very high height. It will drop it. The eaglet will be will be falling. Will be falling. The eagle will go under and scoop it, and then flies up again, drops it. The eagle will do this for the eaglet for two to three weeks. If after three weeks, the eagle or the eaglet, sorry, has not learned to fly, the eagle allows it. That's why an eagle can give birth to about six eaglets and only two to three will survive the flying test. That's why there are a few of them. But the ones that survive the test, they enjoy the strong wind. The Bible says, while other animals run away from the storm, the eagles go towards the storm. When they see the storm, they, they are glad. Because they know it is time to glide. The ego tests the wing, the strength of the wing in the midst of the storm. The ego is the only animal that runs towards the storm. The only animal. And that's why they, they come to a realm in their journey that they don't fly, they soar. They use their wing to give the wind the direction they want to go to. The word so means that they function without struggles. The life cycle of egos, there are a lot of things about them. You know, the ego goes through a season we call rejuvenation. That is, in certain season, an adult ego of its life he goes to stay under a rock on top of the mountain for 40 days. He doesn't eat anything. What he does is that it sheds off all the wings. Anytime an ego begins to grow old and then it is becoming weak, he goes to stay in one place for 40 days. No food, no water. He sheds out all the wings because he can't fly again. So shedding out the wings, it has to be in a place. And remember, they don't eat dead things. So you can't say they store their food. You can't say they carried birds or they carried fish to come and kill. An ego can only eat what it has killed. If it has not killed it, it can't eat it. And then when it has killed it, the following day, the ego cannot test it. They eat it fresh. So they shed all their wings to the point that they can't fly. 
And these wings will take 40 days to grow up. By 40 days, new wings are grown. The eagle targets the Eurocliders wing and flies into it. And then it will hit the wing. It will hit the wing until it masters the, 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 the wind again. And then that is how the Bible says that they that wait upon the Lord shall mount up their wings like eagles. We know flying like eagles. Do you wait like eagles? Because the flying strength of every eagle is deduced from the waiting strength of eagles. They that wait upon the Lord that wait upon the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord. You can, you can watch pornography 12 to 3. You can chat 12 to 6 a.m. You can do all manner of things. Watch BB Nigeria 12 to 6. You are watching people that are sleeping, but you can't pray for one hour. And you want to soar like eagles. You want to fly high like eagles. You want to fly high in life. There is no destiny for the spiritually lazy. No destiny for the spiritually lazy. No destiny for the spiritually lazy. The world is a battleground. It takes the vehement in spirit to survive this battleground. The vehement in spirit. Only the violent they get it by force. They shall mount up wings as eagles. Mount up wings as eagles. But you know that eagles grow their wings in waiting. Aye. What did I say? What did I say? In waiting. In waiting. When was the last time you fasted? When was the last time you took a time off? A time off? And said, I must settle this. Just this Friday prayer. Some of you can't even wait. <laughs> That's why the church has been introduced to 45 minute service. Forty-five indomie services. Forty-five minutes, the pastor is done, and you are applauding the pastor. Wow, this is the kind of service I want. No, it is not you that want the service; it is your spiritual lazy bone that want the service. <laughs> if we call for a prayer meeting. Everybody come and it's going to be a prayer thing for some hours. Will you show up? But call for a party. Spin stars and battle loss party and there will be food. Everybody shows up. I discovered that what makes men grow is difficult to do. So if you want to grow, seek difficult task. If you come to church to serve and there is a particular place everybody is rushing, discover the one everybody is running away from. Because the major and the core blessing is in things that people run away from. Like it is normal and natural that if you are in the choir, if you are giving role every day, you will be coming. But it is not normal when someone for three years has not sung and the person sits down at the back. That's where the blessing is. Those ones that are not seen, serving from behind. Those ones that are not recognized. Those ones that are not appreciated. God doesn't train his men in the palace. Are you aware that Joseph stayed in the prison for 12 years? 10 to 12 years. Some theologians say 10. Some say 12. And many of them say 12. 
12 years, a man stayed in a prison for the offense he didn't commit. It was in that place that all he needed to become a prime minister was put in him. Do you know why? God used that place to teach him the laws of the land. Because everyone that committed a crime came into the prison. She was the one asking them, what crime did you commit? They will say, I did this and this thing happened. So he, he knew the law. God taught him the law. He studied law in the prison. So he can administer law as a prime minister. God cannot promote any man he has not trained. Some of the things God is introducing you to secretly, our John is he's taking you in the realms of the spirit. For a place you are going. Some of your travails of soul is so you can prevail in life. It's so you can prevail. It's so you can have spiritual stamina. Spiritual strength and vigor and vitality to sustain yourself even in the midst of adversity. So by the time Joseph stayed for 12 years in the prison, he had, he had already learned the law, all the laws of Egypt. When he was brought out, he was not brought into the palace as a novice. He was brought in as a man who had studied the culture, the laws and everything of the land. When God took him to the Potiphar's house, what did God take him there to do? Potiphar was a, a prominent politician and also a witty trader. He was so powerful in trading. God was teaching him the economic power and strength of Egypt. Every stop point of Joseph's life Every stop point. When he was lower than in the pit, that was when God taught him humility. For Jesus learned from what he suffered. God taught him humility and he taught him forgiveness. That any man that must justify in life must have a heart to forgive others. It doesn't matter if they strip you naked. That is, the word nakedness, they took all the garments of Joseph and they stripped him naked. Naked means people have come to a point that they touched your dignity. They said things you did. You told them a secret. And even went ahead to say things you didn't do. Like a lady saying, this man of God slept with me when it never happened. You know, it doesn't look like you should forgive the person. Like someone saying in church around the believers that you have committed abortion six times when you have not done it. The person is stripping you naked of your honor. But in that realm, God is teaching you forgiveness. He's teaching you that exploit must have a regulator called love. The Bible says, for faith worked by love. Faith is the instrument of exploit. But faith cannot be possible if it is not regulated. The Bible says, for faith works by love. What does it mean? If you see a car without a brake, no matter how beautiful it is, it will crash. So there must be a brake. There must be an accelerator. And there must be a brake. The accelerator is the accelerant. It takes off. But there must be a brake. So faith is that energy of the spirit that takes off. But it must be regulated by love. If not, you will have a destiny crash. So God was teaching Joseph, how to fly. Every journey he took him from. Every journey. Do you know where the journey began? The father's love. But the seventh thing will not always be with Jesus. That's why if you have done the right thing and God is silent, he is blessing you. Because the father cannot always be with you. A time comes, he allows them to take away the coat of many colors. And then you go to a strange land. Because you will not always learn when the master is speaking. I am with you. Keep going. Keep going. At a time it disappears. His voice you won't hear. In fact, in destiny matters, you won't hear again. That peak of it. That's what happened to Jesus. From Gethsemane, the father withdrew. He connected heaven. The father wasn't talking again. He looked into heaven. He saw darkness everywhere. And the father turned his back. He screamed, Eloi, Eloi. You know, it wasn't Christ that screamed. It was Jesus. 
you know in biology the bible tells us that a woman submits how many chromosomes 23 and a man submits 23 chromosomes to become what in the case of jesus the mother brought 23 chromosomes the father didn't bring it was god the father that brought 23 that was why jesus was full man and full god so now two personalities played a role the mother and god the father so anytime jesus spoke you must know which arm of the family that spoke whether it is maternal or paternal when he said if it is possible let this call pass over me it wasn't paternal that spoke immediately he spoke it maternal spoke paternal slapped maternal he said not my will but your will So when he said Eloi, Eloi, Lama Shabbatani, it wasn't Christ, it was Jesus. Jesus is from the maternal side. Christ is from the paternal side. Christos is the ordination. Jesus is the man part. That's why today there are people answering Jesus. The maternal. So when he said Eloi, Eloi, Lama Shabbatani, my father, my father, why has thou forsaken me? Who was crying? Maternal family. Unto the Lamb of God We raise a sound We raise Unto the El Elyon We raise a sound We raise Unto the Lamb of God, we raise a sound. We raise a sound. Unto the man of war, we raise a sound. We raise a sound. So at every stop in Joseph's life, how did Joseph begin the journey? He began the journey like Psalms 23. The father's love. The father loved him. Sewed coat of many colors. He was excited. He didn't know a time comes that even the father will go blind and stop seeing him. A time comes when he will cry from the pit and the father will not be there. The Bible says when a man is young, he dresses up and goes to where he wants to go to. But when a man has grown, he will need someone to dress him and take him to a place he doesn't want to go to. That's the journey of disciples. When God invades you without your permission. Some of us, what we are going through is the process of divine dealings. So the eagle begins to teach the eaglet how to fly. At this point, the eagle is teaching the eaglet that if you must fly high, you must leave your comfort zone. So now, let me say this. Why, God, why does God try and test us? Number one, I will end here. Why does God try? Why does he test us? 
Why does God try and test us? Number one. Pressure produces enlargement. Psalms 4 verse 1. Psalms 4 1. Pressure produces enlargement. Psalms 4 1. You hear me when I call, O God, of my righteousness. Thou has enlarged me when I was in distress. Did you see that? Thou has enlarged me when I was in distress. Do you know when David wrote this psalm? Eh? When he wrote this psalm is the night after the death of his son. The son that died as a result of, you know his story with Bathsheba. That's when he wrote this psalm. He wrote this psalm after the greatest failure of his life. He said, you enlarged me in my distress. He said, have mercy and hear my prayer. It was the sinful time of his life. So pressure will produce enlargement. Number two, trials prove and humbles us. Trials prove and humble us. God teaches us humility through trials. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse number 15. 16 and 17. Deuteronomy 8. Sorry. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 15. He says, who led thee through the great and terrible wilderness, wherein we are fiery scorpions, serpent and scorpions, and drought, that is lack, no water, and there was no water. Who brought thee forth water out of the rock? Look at verse 16. Who fed in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, and that he might prove thee to, thee to do thee good at thy letter end. New King James, and thou say in your heart, my power and my might, and the might of mine, mine hand, hath gotten me this world. So trials. Please, New King James from henceforth. Trials prove, God uses trials to prove us, to know how much we love him, and then also to humble us. Number three, trials increase the power of God in us. I think I will end here. Anytime you ask God for power, he weakens you. God can only empower the weak. Now, let me tell you this. Anytime you come to a time you feel you are too righteous, you are more righteous to others, God will break your defense system and allow a temptation to conquer you. You know, one day Paul was in the council, it was a conference in Jerusalem. And then his spiritual grandfather was there by name Peter. His spiritual father was there by name Ananias. As Paul was in the council with the council of elders, he left there, he said, of all they saved, he profited me nothing. He said, I didn't learn anything from these people. They are not loaded. How can elders gather? Your spiritual father was there, Ananias. That God in heaven depended on to open your eyes. And then your spiritual grandfather was there, by name Peter. And everything they spoke, even though I know Peter, Paul had revelation. He was studious. But sometimes God will give you a man that you know better than so he can teach you to be humble. <laughs> sometimes God sends you to learn from a man you are by far better than. So sometimes he puts you under a choir leader who is not as educated as you are. At the boy, he used to be a proud man. So intelligent. He led his class all his years. Came out with first class. Was a root. In early 30s, he already 
was headed to professorship. And God told him to leave the town, leave his job, and go to a village to a man who does not know how to say come and be interpreting him in crusades. He had to stay in a place where there was no light. And the man will speak Yoruba, he will interpret in English. The first time I heard something like that. There was no future. How can a PhD holder be under an illiterate? No future. But God was teaching him humility. What if he didn't follow that path? What if he said no? So one day he told God, is this how my life will end up? God says, stay there. If you miss this man, you will miss your place in destiny. And then he stayed on that hill trait. He said that we have offering. Offering was nothing. He was not up to his salary. He was earning. I mean, one year offering wasn't up to his one month salary. And guess what? Even that one year offering was not coming to him. Hunger set in. But God was knocking up pride from him. So why some of us, we have to go through what we have to go through? It's so God can teach us to know that it is not of him that runs, not of him that wills, but of God that shows mercy. So you feel it is by your beauty. God allows men to keep breaking your heart. So that you will know that beauty does not give you a good man. It is the grace of God that gives you a settled marriage. It is not about being fluent or eloquent. If you study very well, how many people are on top that made first class? It's good to get great. I made first class in my second degree. Yes, I did. I made first class. It's good to get great. I'm not against great. But when you have gotten great, you will know that great has an uncle called grace. It's not of him that runs, not of him that wills, but of God that shows mercy. So trial teaches us humility. So anytime a man asks God for power, what God does first is that he weakens the man. He asks you, are you serious? When you ask God for power, he asks you, are you serious? You say, yes, I'm serious. So his response to your yes will be to weaken you first. Psalms chapter 102 verse 23 is in the Bible. Psalms 102 verse 23. Because the power of God does not flow the direction of strength. He flows the direction of weakness. He weakened my strength. In the way, he shortened my days. I said, oh Lord, do not take me away in the midst of my days. Your years are throughout all generations. As he began to pray, God restored the years, but he weakened his strength. He restored the years, but he didn't restore the strength. That's why when Paul now left the, the council of elders in Jerusalem, he said of everything they said is, I learned nothing. He profited me nothing. After that, God allowed the messenger of Satan to come upon his body. Saul had an issue. Paul had an issue. He started saying the good I wanted to do, I see myself not doing them. The bad I don't want to do, I see myself doing them. He said, and God allowed the messenger of Satan to torment my body. And I went to the Lord in prayer. Do you know what God told him? He said, remain there. Remain there. He said, be there. My grace is sufficient. God didn't take it away. God said, I have given you grace to go through it. Oh. He said, my grace is sufficient. For my strength is made manifest in weakness. He said, be weak. And then, when God has taken him through the process of humility, the statement of Paul changed. You will now let us see Paul say things like, I don't count myself to have apprehended. 
He said, for I, I, I am the least amongst all of them. I am the least. I am the least of all the apostles. So try us, humble us. But if you don't learn the lesson of trial, you will remain down forever. It is supposed to introduce you to a certain level and your lifting will come. But listen to me, if you don't pass the exam, God will not promote you. Before you can move from one class to another class, there is an exam to write. If you write them and fail, and write it again and fail, and you've written them 14 times, you now carry your sleep and say, well, I want to see the teacher of them. Where is she? This is my 15th time. I am getting old. Do you know that statistics say that every year there are about 12 point something million people that register to gain admission into higher institution. Only 1.9 million make it. There are people who wrote many times. If you meet the DG, what will he tell you? He will say, okay, it's okay. Go and study hard so you can pass it. So tears does not fetch you promotion in the school of God. You must pass the exam. And as long as it takes, you will be there. There are people who stay six months and left the class. There are others who have stayed 16 years in a particular level and can't leave the place. So trial is supposed to teach you to be humble. But if you can't learn the lesson, you remain at the, at the same place. That's why there are people who could not emerge. The Bible says in 2-3 of the book of Exodus that after she could no longer hide the child, there comes a time in the destiny of a man that the destiny of a man emerges. That a man emerges becoming a new person. Even if you don't want to be introduced, God will introduce you. After she could no longer hide the child, the destiny emerged. When God has taken you through his school, he has taught you. He will now unveil you and announce you to the ends of the earth so you can be a mentor to the coming generation. Now I want to say this and I will begin to pray. Let me say this. Next week we can continue. There are three sources. There are three sources of trials. Three sources of trials. There are three causes of trials. Number one is the dealings of God. Number two is self-induced trouble. The trouble you cost yourself. The first one is the dealings with God. God is taking you through a process. Number three is attacks of Satan. This one is not being, not within God's will. God is not the one sending this one. I will tell you your response to this kind of trials. Next week, I will show you what you will see and you will know the one you are going through. Whether it is divine dealings or self-induced trouble or attacks from Satan. What are your responses to these trials? If it is God's dealings with you, what do I do? One word submit James chapter 4 verse number 7 if it is God's dealing that is his will, submit James 4 7 he said therefore submit to God therefore submit to God number 2, if it is self induced trouble what do I do, one word learn if it is self induced trouble what you cost yourself, what do you need to do, learn Learn, learn. Number three, if it is an attack from Satan, what do I do, man of God? One word, fight. So if it is a dealing with God, submit. If it is self-induced trouble, learn from it. If it is an attack from the devil, fight. James 4, 7b. The Bible says resist the devil and he will flee from you. So next week I will show you signs and symptoms to know if it is dealings with God or self-induced trouble or an attack from Satan. Because where you are in your life we will determine some of us are going through divine dealings and others are going through attacks from the devil. The approach are different. Their solutions are different. In divine dealings, 
there are things you need to do. You, you submit. And there are about seven elements of this submission. Things you must do submitting. For instance, when God is making you wait, you do what waiters do. You serve. But if, if it is the devil that is delaying you, there is something you must do. You must resist. You must fight. You must roll away all the arsenals of heaven and fight against the fiery dart of the wicked one. You must wage war. You must wage war. You must wage war. You must wage war. You must engage the fiery weapons of the righteous. The Bible says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are strong and mighty through God to the pulling down of every stronghold, casting down imagination and everything that has raised itself against the knowledge of God. So if it is God dealing with you, you will have to, you will have to submit. Submit to the counsel of God. Because terrible in all your ways, Emmanuel.